people are trying to make it complicated. So they were trying to make it really simple for everyone. So there's no debate going forward, um, but there will be debate going forward because there's some stupid stuff happening. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about types of testing, what's happened in New Zealand in the last three or four years, um, what the kind of current state of affairs is right now, and what we should be doing uh, instead. Um, so types of testing, we've got three kind of different ways to think about this. We've got small scale tests, that's, that's intermediate and full scale. So a small scale test is I've got a product, a material, I want to know if that's going to be combustible and light on fire. That's a pretty easy test with lots of ways to test that. I'll, I'll give you pretty similar results. Um, internationally, there's kind of five or six different machines you can use to test these. They're all going to probably be about the same. Um, intermediate scale is where you're taking some details or, or parts of walls, you're putting combinations of parts together, you're testing to see how that part of, the, part of that wall works. And then the full scale test is where you're building an actual building lighting on fire and seeing how well it does or doesn't burn. Um, so they're kind of how we delineate these. Um, so the small scale test, um, again, ignitability and the things we're looking for on this are energy release. So peak heat is how hot it gets, and then total heat is how much energy is produced. So you get a graph kind of like this one. It looks familiar if anyone knows what product this is. Um, that's your peak. So it's how, how high, how hot does it get? And then your total is the, basically the area under the curve, how much heat. And the combination of those two things is really important. If things, things get really hot really quickly, they might light something else on fire really quickly. Um, and if something stays on fire for a long time at a really hot rate, then it has more potential to light something on fire. So the combination of those two things you'll see throughout codes, throughout tests, um, that's kind of what they refer to. Um, so we're looking at materials, those are the kind of things we're looking at. Um, so small scale tests, when we look at the whole cladding system, if everything in the wall is non-combustible, then it's probably not gonna light on fire, pretty good chance of that. Now the term everything, has some, has some quotes around it. It's just certain things that are exempt depending on how you read certain codes, certain interpretations. That's where it starts to get kind of gray. Um, and where the other, other tests are become way more important. So again, this small scale test, if you can prove everything in your wall is not gonna burn, you're pretty much safe. Um, and then if you do have something combustible, you need to go to the next step to a larger test. And that's where you start looking at how do the combinations of materials all work together. So how do you layer them up together to stop fire from one source to another source? Um, how do, if you have two materials that are kind of combustible, do those two things come together and make a super combustible material? Um, those are the things we're testing together. Um, this is also where you test individual details, so penetration through things, um, cavity barriers, slabbage controls, those kind of things is the intermediate size testing. Um, these can be actually really useful tests because they'll give you an indicative idea of how that detail and that combination of materials together is going to perform when you put it into other different walls or kind of other things. So if you have a reasonably good level of data in this intermediate, you can start to piece together um, some pretty um, good solutions that you know have confidence that will work. Um, and this is kind of where we think a lot of people will start to trend in that medium space is looking for testing combinations of things together to prove that I mean, it is combustible, can be safely used in walls. Um, <clears throat> then we get to the full scale test. Um, these are the much more complicated, much more complex, um, but these really give you an accurate picture of how it's going to perform on a building in the event there was a, a, was a fire. <clears throat> so you've got some sort of model, you light it on fire, and then you kind of evaluate the observations. Now, what's important to remember about these tests is it has certain failure criteria. So, well, something may pass the criteria, there might be observations within that that are useful data points. You can't really ignore them. Um, so for instance, you might have a test that didn't, the flame didn't spread above a certain height and that's, that's a, a criteria that's been passed. But you might be interested also in, well, did, was there a structural failure of the building? Did the, did the studs collapse during the fire? Those are kind of observations that may not be failure criteria but maybe a very important observation for us. Um, the other really interesting, really important part is if you test something like this, it works like that, that's how you have to use it on the building. Just because it's been part of a wall system 
system doesn't mean it's going to behave that way if you change the layers, change the makeup, change the details. So what was tested in the boot has to be the same as what goes on the outside. And I'll show you why it's super important going forward. Um, so this is the New Zealand context. Um, so we've got a building act that says people who use building can get out of the buildings on fire. Pretty sensible. Um, we get down to the next thing is kind of the acceptable solutions, building code parts of pre-2018. This is how the code is written. It's got an exemption for a sprinkler building. So if you're building a sprinkler, there's no requirement for any combustible cladding tests at all. You can literally build with any material you like. Sprinklers will save the day. <laughs> um, sprinklers, 88% of the time didn't work. This is a U.S. study. Um, so about 12% of the time, 8% they didn't work at all. They weren't, in, weren't effective. Um, they're even less effective on the outside of buildings. The Melbourne the crossfire. Um, this spread up a balcony fire, spread up several floors. Sprinkler building, no sprinklers on the outside is not going to stop your fire. So 2018, everyone went, oh, hang on, the sprinkler exemption thing might not be working for us. <laughs> um, let's take that sprinkler exemption out. Now let's go back to having, oops, sorry, go back one. So 2019 was actually a really important, um, really important code clause with fires and combustible claddings. Um, it was written really, really well. The code, acceptable solution, was written really, really well. It had a couple key things in it. It said substantive components. Um, so this is a new thing, not just the cladding materials, not just the rigid air barriers, and substantive components. That was defined later on in the next slide. Um, this also said that now we have some requirements even in sprinkler buildings. You can't just use anything we want. We have to have some level of surety on what they're gonna do. So no more sprinkler exemption. Now we're looking at whole wall systems. So <clears throat> substantive components further defined in the cladding guidance in 2019. Um, right there, it says framing. It says framing right there, right there. It's <laughs> all across the guidance. <laughs> framing must be considered and must be non-combustible. Mm. That's CAS2 in 2019 version. I don't know how people have missed this, <laughs> including Envy. Oh. In the same guidance mm. document, they say, don't worry about the framing, oh. it's going to oh. be fine. <laughs> okay, so now we get into bizarro world. Um, 2020, if you've been following as closely as I have, you've been pulling your hair out. Oh, sorry. This slide. Yeah. Okay, 2020. So what happened in 2020 was there's a bit of confusion, gray area. There wasn't enough tests. There's different tests that weren't in the code. And in February through April 2020, uh, and we put out a consultation document that said, here's the changes we'd like to make to the code. What do you think? And so they added on a couple new couple new test methods. 8414 was introduced as a thing you could do. It had NFP 285. Um, it just clarified basically all the things that were in 2019. Really good document. 80% um, of respondents said this is a really good way forward. Um, so this is really cool. In November 2020, we got a completely different set of rules. And it's, it's gone completely a different direction, which is, is really, really difficult to grasp why. Um, now we've got, in 2020, we've got cladding materials only required in 10 to 25 meters. So now framing has been, been removed from the considerations, <laughs> explicitly removed. Um, we've got non-combustible. These are actually the same test, basically. Um, and now here's where it gets really dangerous for me is that 8.3C says you can use part of an entire external wall cladding system. The safety of the wall system has tested. It says you can use the results of an 8414 test, an MP 285 test, and now you can take that product and substitute it into your wall system and believe that it's safe. Um, cavity barriers are kind of now introduced for the first time. Um, they don't really define it very well what those are, how you test them, what they need to do. Um, we've got an idea of what it's supposed to do, uh, but you need those even if your building with your poles are tested to a to a tested system, which is actually contradictory to the system if you keep changing it. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff going on in this in this paragraph um, that we need to unpack. Now, the really dangerous part of the, the about this is the parts of walls. Um, I'm going to there's a really graphic example of this. Have that mouse again. <clears throat> Nope. 
here. Um, solar text. So Greenfield Tower. This installation was tested to 8414. It passed the test because the combination of materials they used in the test were such the installation didn't catch fire. Now, if you copied 8414, this wouldn't have happened. They did something completely different because this is deceptive marketing, all that kind of stuff. But we've actually now written a, a building code clause that would allow this installation to be used <laughs> outside of the tested system. So we've actually gone the complete opposite way and said, actually, this is a perfectly good um, wall assembly to use on an eight story tall building. That's literally what's been written into the code. It's crazy. Um, so 2019 to 2020, there's been some really um, subtle changes if you weren't paying attention, but significant changes if you were. Um, it's these words here. So small scale test on, it used to be substantive components. Now it's down to cladding, rigid air barrier and insulation. And then in 2020, now it's just cladding materials. So there's been a substantial erosion from substantial requiring timber framing to be considered. Now it doesn't matter. You can use whatever you want inside the walls. It's not going to matter. Um, so that's been a, there's no, no evidence to support this, by the way. It's just somebody's made this up. Um, and then I think this is kind of the justification for it because testing's expensive. Right. Seems like a really bizarre mm -hmm. reason to not be safe in buildings. Um, there's a consultation document on these changes. If you want a really good laugh, you can read through it. Um, it talks all about how or not these changes are gonna um, upset the sector. Um, <laughs> Let's think about remaining options, proposed changes. So there were no changes proposed from 2019 to 2020 in April. There was no change proposed. All we were proposing is a couple extra tests to allow us to use international tests, to use greater, um, greater tests, different understanding. Um, this has always been a requirement to do a full scale test if you have combustible elements. That hasn't changed since 20, since June 2020, 2019. Um, and instead, we've ended up with um, a really, really dangerous uh, potential code um, clause. Um, so literally, this is what's happened in the last uh, two weeks. Now, I've asked Andy, I've asked Andy to clarify, is this what they meant to do? Did they mean to say that this type of assembly was acceptable for use? <laughs> or did they mean to say that all buildings should be tested to the 8414 standard and that's the system that you can use going forward? Neither one of those are good answers for MB. It's gonna be a very awkward conversations going forward. Um, I'm gonna distill this down to two things. This is really, really simple. Use non-combustible products or use a fully tested system. That's the only way you can build cladding systems over 10 meters. No debates, no gray areas, there's nothing. This is the only safe way to do it. Until we have more data, until we come up with some other kind of systems, we have a, a large body of evidence, that's how you should be designing walls. And that's exactly what it said in 2019. <laughs> Substantial parts of the wall need to be non-combustible or they need to be tested. That was in 2019, that was a year and a half ago. There's no reason to change it. We don't know why it changed or what evidence you used to change. Um, obviously with this, just because you can do something stupid doesn't mean you should. Um, so they've given people some loopholes, some, some ways to do really dangerous things. Don't fall for the trap. Make intelligent choices and we can all be safe and, and everyone can get out of buildings in the event of a fire. So that's what's going on. It's really <laughs> scary stuff, but yeah, I'll take any questions because it's pretty confusing stuff. Yeah. John, why do you think they're changing everything every year and just doing this sort of thing? What, what do you think the driving force behind it? Uh, so I think that it's the pushback to change. Um, people are pushing back at having to change, having to do something different. Um, pushing back with saying, well, where's the evidence of a fire happening? Or, and I think the technical side is really going, we don't want to have that kind of risk out there. And then you have manufacturers and that, that supply side going, we don't want to change, we want to keep doing what we're doing. It seems to be working fine. So you have this constant tension of the science saying one thing and the industry saying the other thing, and they keep flip-flopping back and forth. And what you end up with now is a code that doesn't actually speak to itself. It's saying different things depending on how you interpret it and which way you read it on which day. So until we 
I mean, until we go to the science side, we have to kind of ignore the industry, unfortunately, and say, actually, we're regulating the industry to keep people safe. And the science is how we do that. And so we start doing that, we're going to end up with this flip flop and the industry keeps going over in circles, which actually is detrimental to the industry because now you can't plan anything. So it just seems yeah. so simple what you're saying, but <laughs> I don't understand why. So, yeah, I mean, we're going to have a similar argument, similar problem with the building for climate change. When we start to improve thermal performance and comfort in buildings, we're going to have pushback from the industry again. So the way the building for climate change has been structured, though, is actually quite good. It, it sets future targets. So it sets things way out in the future so the industry can, can prepare for things. These seem to be reactionary, happening overnight. Mm. And then everyone's reacting, interpreting, and, and fighting amongst each other. Mm. So, yeah, that's what's happening. <laughs> um, kind of feeding into what you just said, do you think that the confusion and the fact that the code doesn't speak to each itself and there's so many contradictory things in it, does that add to the fear from the industry and that's why they don't want to change things? Because it's like, oh, well, it still doesn't make any sense, so give us something easy to do kind of thing. Is that, is it, is, is that maybe part of it? Uh, I, my personal opinion is people making decisions don't understand what they want. They, they don't understand whether they want buildings under 25 meters to be combustible or not combustible. They haven't drawn a clear line and stuck to it. I mean, as a regulator, that's what you're supposed to do. It's draw, here's what we consider safe. Everyone abide by the rules. That's one of my questions. Yeah. Sending that me in here? No? Uh, okay. Are roof construction methods also being reviewed? <laughs> This is from Mike uh, Skilton. <laughs> um, no, roofs are not being reviewed. <laughs> there's, uh, there's only one part of the fire clause that, that talks about roofs and spread of flame, which is when you have a lower roof and an upper roof. That is a fire protection requirement between those. Um, but fire passing across roofs, not considered anywhere in the code. Ends at ICC, pretty good example of that. Um, there's also, a lot, I think, a lot of gray area on IT walls that go across and fire rating of um, metal roofs, which have flutes and air gaps. There's no, no one's ever tested that junction before. You throw some, some stuff in there and you hope it works, but no one's really tested them. I've never seen a fire test for that before. So, I mean, roofs is, yeah, another really great example of a dangerous thing that needs to be looked at. Sure. Um, got one from William Stewart. Um, the image of burnt balconies was interesting. Do you think non-combustible facade buildups should also be extended to non-combustible balconies? It's a really good question. Um, it depends what a balcony is being used for. Our, our code doesn't talk about what balconies are used for at all. It's got a couple things. You can't spread fire across property boundaries. That's kind of, I guess, the, I guess where the balcony would be a property boundary, you could consider that. Um, arguably, you could use a balcony as a firefighting platform, and the collapse of that has some structural requirements to it. Now, whether you're going to stand on a balcony and try to fight the fire below you, I don't think so, um, but you could, I guess. Maybe get somebody out of a, out of a building. Um, it's an area that's not really well defined by the code. I don't think there's any interest in defining it. This is a gray area, unfortunately. Cool. Uh, last one here online is, does Auckland Council agree with the MD changes? Or do they even know what's going on? Publicly or privately? <laughs> um, I mean, up to you. You're the one answering the question. I would say that, um, in general, often council would more likely support the 2019 version of the code. And I think that 2021 has uh, some questions on how they're supposed to regulate that. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Cool. But th going back to, do you want to have to keep iterating and changing? If you go to the 2019 version of the code and follow that and develop design solutions like we have, you're never going to have to change. If you come up with those solutions, you're never going to have to make a change. The building code won't get safer than 2019. That was, that was a very safe way to write a code. If you're going to try and fight and find loopholes for each iteration of the code, you're going to be continually innovating and changing wall assemblies to keep up with the codes. So it makes sense just to get over here. Here's a safe design we know. It'll never have to change. We can stick with that and move on with our lives. That's why I hate talking about fire, because everyone could solve it today, and we would never talk about it again. Now, there are lots of safe ways to build walls um, using different products and layers of buildups. Um, on a particular project, if you've got a question, just email us. We'll talk privately about what you can do with your project. The easiest way to do it. 
what about, when you said earlier about everything has to be non-combustible, what about there's lots of little exceptions to the rule. How far does it go, like you know, penetration seals, uh, seal tapes, even membranes and stuff mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, here's where it gets interesting. It's, it's, um, so there's a, you know, consider an element and whether that element lighting on fire is going to be able to leapfrog off the building somehow. So an isolated penetration point lighting on fire, probably not going to be able to get to the next one. Yeah. Now, if you had a bunch of um, a bunch of clips in a row, let's say very closely spaced, which were highly combustible, yeah. um, then you might start thinking about that. Um, yeah. And then if you're protecting them with a rockable product so that don't have that same combustible, combustible problem, uh, that's where you need some expert kind of interpretations on that. And that's where the full scale testing comes in too. Mm -hmm. When you start introducing multiple little, little bits of it, um, then you kind of got to need to go to a booth to figure out do all those things add up to something dangerous or not. What about membrane? Uh, so membrane is a really good example. There's, there's, there's an exclusion that's included. Um, so there's a one millimeter thick exclusion, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And it's one millimeter is kind of really cut it off. And that recognizes that those types of products may flash off and be combustible. But back to that peak heat versus total heat, you're going to get a really quick flash and it's going to die off really quickly. So there's not enough oomph behind it to actually ignite something. That's where the membranes are kind of excluded, ignored, whatever. Now, that exclusion is backed up with a lot of full scale testing with these products. So it's not like we're just making this up. We don't have evidence to support it. We've seen it when you test full scale walls with membranes on them, the membrane will flash off really quickly um, and then kind of die away. So that's why we consider them to be safe, for example. Yeah. I got all kinds of questions. Yeah. Let's um, go. The, <laughs> uh, the one term that you said wasn't defined very, very well, which was the interstory um, cavity barriers. Cavity barriers. How would you just define a good one that works? Um, so the cavity barriers in Europe are intumescent strips that expand and close off an area. An area. That's what we think of here in New Zealand too, cavity barriers. Now in North America, we think of cavity barriers as a piece of metal across the cavity. What it's meant to do is stop flame going from one story to the other story. So if you've got a chimney effect, you want to just block off that. Now, <clears throat> We talk about cavity barriers that are intumescence. There's a test that you, that's been developed in the, U, in the UK to test those. Now, because it'll take a while to expand, they've got a five minute delay grace period. So any flame going past it, the first five minutes, that doesn't count. Don't worry about that. It's got to fully see after five minutes. Now, if you've got, let's say, timber batten, a timber batten, that first five minutes, your flame may have already gone way past that strip. Now, if you put the first, first of that, you've got a steel flashing across that. The flame is not going to go through it right away, but over time that flash is going to heat up and may start to ignite that timber. And this is where we get into this example where we don't really have good testing data on different ways to do that. And it's not really well defined on what tests you're supposed to use for that in our code. So what would you recommend then? I think steel is going to be a lot safer than to us strip. Okay. Changing from, a steel, from an aluminium to a steel cross cavity flashing. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty easy substitution. Now switching aluminum to a melting point of 650, steel is about 1200. So if you use an aluminum cross cavity flashing, the fire is going to burn through it pretty quick. It's going to go in the next story. But switching to a steel cross cavity flashing, at least you're going to keep the fire at that spot. Flames are going to stay there. You may have some heat transferring up to the next level, but it's going to be slower. And would you mitigate that heat transfer risk by not having combustible things above that flashing or just lobbing? Oh, of course, yeah, because <laughs> if your steel's hot, but there's nothing above it that's actually going to light on fire, then pretty safe. Yeah. Cool. No more questions online. Anyone else got questions? Yeah. What about a material that isn't combustible? But yes. essentially just some melts like a polycarbonate or something like that. How is that interpreted? Like aluminium. Okay. <laughs> it's really well. Uh, so this really talks to spread of flame. So combustibility is, does it ignite and does it stay lit? That's the A1, A2 classifications. Something melting um, that's not on fire probably isn't going to be a problem. Well, it's going to be a problem, but it's not, not considered in the code, I should say. Yeah. So I, I think just being, and this goes, goes back to just making good decisions. If you know something's not going to perform well on fire, like a PVC or a plastic, if there are alternatives you can use, which are can be substituted in that don't have that concern, you can, you can eliminate those concerns quite a bit. 
but just thinking about how you're engaged. Uh, elements that are combustible, yeah. right? Um, but are well protected. Yeah. I think you might know what I'm talking about. Um, and you can prove that they, yeah, they prove that they can form a full scale test. Yep. And um, you talk about you know a tire system being non combustible, and that's fine. Yep. The parts that are combustible but are adequately protected. What are some of the things that a fire engineer or someone like go through to make a, a judgment on that? Because something that we're dealing with at the moment is getting people, even brands or whatever, to make judgments on things is yep. really difficult. It's interesting to see you know, what are those. Did I mention your product? Yeah, yeah. All right, so Anthony is from Technoform. They've got an isolator clip, thermal isolator clip, um, which allows you to use external insulation and, and run a rail across it. Now, the clip itself is made from a combustible product. It's, it's just intermittently through a wall. Um, but in the full-scale fire test they've done, they've encapsulated or surrounded that clip with a rockable product, which is really good in fire. It's really, really good. Um, so in that full-scale test, <clears throat> Once you run the test, you take the cladding off, you can see that actually those, those clips weren't really affected. They didn't, they didn't contribute to spread of flame. So that's where someone, um, an educated person, could take a look at that and make an assessment on what was the contribution of that component to this particular wall. And then what does my new wall look like? What are the differences? What are the challenges? What's been modified? And how much of an impact will that have? So for instance, if you tested with one type of cladding, let's say a fiber cement cladding or an aluminum, now you want to switch to a steel cladding. Well, that, that's a difference to change. It's probably not going to amount to much in the spread of flame. It's going to be a little bit of concern about um, trapping some of the hot gases inside so they're leaving. Um, but you can start to make those assessments once you have that full-scale data. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't have a lot of full-scale data on timber frame walls yet. We've got maybe four or five tests, um, and like three of them sucked. <laughs> so until we sort of build a portfolio of how these materials work, we can't make those kind of leaps at this point. Yes. So following up on that, should the government maybe be providing grants and things like that so that people can start testing if the complaint is that they're too expensive? Is that a cool way to do it? Or should people just start spending money to do the tests? So I understand there is a testing program happening at, um, Places in the bottom of the North Island. Um, they've got some various manufacturers together. They're putting together parts of walls. They're lighting fires to see what kind of happens. Um, I don't think we're going to get the full story out of those reports. Um, if someone wants to press, I'm sure they can find some of the early, early tests from that, um, which would probably not surprise a lot of people. Would surprise other people. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a definite need to have government-funded testing agencies not just compile in one spot. We could probably support two or three at the moment. And anyone that has a system, has a test, has a building that wants to go for a test, here's your grant money, here's your 100,000 bucks, go do your test and you rock, you rock and roll. Now I suggest that we can probably do 30 tests to cover every different wall assembly in the market. So for about 3 million bucks, we could probably test every single building we're gonna build for the next 30 years for 3 million bucks. We just don't have the facilities to do it right now. So I'll put my hand up and see if anybody wants to go in with us and, and create something like that. Um, yeah. Cool. We got another one online yeah. uh, from Shane. Uh, in the Grenfell example, uh, it's being discovered that suppliers are changing out products and <laughs> supplying old test documents. Who would police this type of thing in New Zealand? <laughs> uh, no one. Mm. There's but, no regulatory body that's checking on components, and the new billing act is going to require that manufacturers to do that. Well, there's no third party check for that. Isn't there a perfect, you know, arm's length government funded organization that should maybe do that kind of thing? Um, there is, yeah. <laughs> but if you compliance and product certifications, they're not a regulatory body, right? They're a testing agency to some degree. Mm. Should they be a regulatory body, though? Uh, should there be a, a nationwide regulatory check for products? Yeah, probably. Um, is somebody willing to fund that at this point? Has, has the competency to, to fulfill that? That's probably the biggest issue. Is you'd really struggle to find a body of people that has the competency to actually properly assess these products. People can run tests, they can make opinions, but we find a lot of those have really big problems in the interpretations. Some of those people have written the current guidance we have. Cool. Any other questions? 
Yeah, what is the cost of those triple scale tests down the line? Mm -hmm. uh, the rumor is one hundred eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. How much? Eighty to one hundred thousand is the rumor. Um, it seems a little high, maybe. If you are there other places you can go other than that place? Yeah, there are other places. It's a good question. So in New Zealand, there's only one test facility right now. Mm -hmm. um, they can do eight four one four. There's two facilities that can do fire resistance testing. Um, now Australia has zero that can do eight four one four. They might have two or three in Australia. I'm pretty sure. Um, and you're into the UK, Dubai, Russia, probably. Different places which you probably can't go right now. Yeah, <laughs> Canada has a few too, but it's a little bit far though, by the so way. Yeah. North America will have a different testing standard. There's just two different tests. There's NFPA 285, which is a smaller one, North America, and the 8414 is a much larger one. Um, the two are slightly different in their interpretations and how big they are and stuff, but 8414 seems to be where most of the people are trending because it's a much larger fire. Cool. All right. Anyone else? Thanks everyone. You can check us out online. We've got all this stuff online. This should be on later. Uh, this will be going on YouTube. <laughs> we also have that 2019 um, code uh, clause. We have a written out explanation of what that means on our website. Go to our resources page to give you kind of a how to and how to do that. Yeah, and in addition, this uh, video is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. I think it's Oculus Architectural Engineering on YouTube. Just search it. I have one more question from Shane. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments about the NZ ICC article in the NZ Herald today? I didn't know they had an article. Yeah, there's an article in the Herald today about NZ ICC and whether the new roof coming back on will be the same as the old roof. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put it, it this way. There are ways to construct that roof that leaving a torch on would not have resulted in that. And it's not going to cost any more or less than what they built the first time. So it makes sense to me to go back with something that's, that's not going to happen again versus putting back the old thing that we know has a risk. And at some point in the history of the NCID ICC, it's not going to be around for only a few years. It's going to live on for hundreds of years. At some point in the next hundred years, that roof will end up fire again, if they build it the same way it was built. Probably. Yeah. Cool. I think that's it for uh, the online gallery here. Cool. cool. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.